For those of you who don't know, I am program chairman. I'm the one who selects all of our speakers, uh, gets the topics for our meetings. I would appreciate it if any of you have a topic that you would like for me to get a speaker for, some subject we never covered. Uh, I'm, it's getting harder and harder to come up with things after about four years of doing this job. So I would appreciate it, any input from any member. If, you, if you've heard a speaker and you think it would be good for our group, just give me a, a note. My email address is notenoughpastas at msn.com. You can always contact me that way. Well, I'm pleased to introduce our speaker, Perry Vogel. As Perry told you, he's from Cone, North Dakota. He moved to Grand Forks in 1993. And he works at Acme Electric. He's an assistant, no, you have an assistant, what was that? A systems programmer. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> uh, computer si information systems, that's what it is. And he got his degree from uh, Wapiton. And uh, his hobbies are Martins, Purple Martins. Anything outdoors, he likes gardening. He said he wasn't a gardener, but after I talked to him, he's a gardener. <laughs> <laughs> Hiking and uh, cross-country skiing are his activities. He's married and he has a 10-year-old son. Welcome, Perry. Uh, thank you for having me. Um, I'm very pleased to be here uh, to present a new uh, presentation, uh, Yards for Purple Martins. I got started with Purple Martins in 2001. Uh, my brother set up, uh, built me a house and we set it up on May 5th and on May 8th I had my first Purple Martin visitor. And that first year I started out with four pair and in 2012, I had 34 pair that fledged 109 young. They laid 155 eggs. And in the presentation, you'll see how I know all these statistics. And that's the one fun thing about these birds is that you can actually touch them, you can actually look at them, you can check them, and it doesn't really bother the purple martins at all. And actually, purple martins are uh, more likely to survive and thrive in your environment if you are an active landlord. Uh, one of the first things I want to kind of talk about is some of the things that people don't really know about purple martins. Uh, one of the myths about purple martins is that they eat uh, 2,000 mosquitoes a day. I'm going to dispel that myth and we're going to talk about uh, hummingbirds which actually do eat mosquitoes a little bit later, which is kind of an interesting thing that not everyone knew. This is not the purple martin, but this is what is uh, commonly ref commonly known as the common house martin. The common house martin lives in Europe, and it is a member of the swallow family, uh, but does not nest in the same way as purple martins do. And the, the common house martin actually nests like a barn swallow, kind of with a mud nest. And this is one of the birds that was um, in the European settlers' minds when they named purple martins. And as you can see, the common house martin doesn't live anywhere near the United States. It's all in the Asian country, and uh, it does uh, it does have uh, the wintering grounds in blue there are in southern Africa and parts of uh, Korea and south of China. This is a number, another member of the swallow family. You can hear it singing. Once again, it's not a purple martin either. Um, you can tell this because it has a completely white belly. The top side is a, a kind of an iridescent purpley sheen. Uh, tree swallows are related to purple martins as well, uh, but they are um, they are not a they don't nest in groups, they nest solitarily. 
And what a tree swallow would nest in is something similar to a bird house that would look like this. Uh, this is actually an uh, eastern bluebird uh, nest box, but tree swallows quite often use them. And you can check these uh, nest boxes as well uh, just by uh, pulling off the little nest box. And once they nest in there, you can check on the babies and you can check on the, the eggs to make sure that there, there aren't any problems with the nest box. And we'll talk a little bit about uh, problems um, as we get a little further on in, in the uh, presentation. One of the things I wanted to mention, if any of you have any questions as we go along, it's way more beneficial just to ask the question, just indicate that you want to uh, get my attention somehow and, and, and ask the question because uh, everyone, um, everyone will benefit from um, those questions. So please. So my question is, because of that pole, the squirrel won't get up there. Right, right. Actually, this um, <clears throat> with with this kind of a pole, it's just actually rebar. And what they recommend uh, doing is uh, taking uh, steel wool and uh, and rubbing it down with steel wool, making it super smooth, and using uh, car wax to prevent any <laughs> prevent anybody yeah. from climbing up onto this pole. Oh, yeah. So this, that particular pole doesn't need a, a pole guard. The tree swallow does nest in uh, the northern, all of Canada and most of the United States. Uh, the southern uh, states of like Texas, Oklahoma, Nebraska, um, sorry, Kansas, uh, they just use those areas for, for, uh, for their migration. And they overwinter in the blue area once again in southern Mex Mexico. I had a friend of mine send me this picture just the other day and ask me if this was this was a purple martin. And everyone knows that um, that we've got these around here. These are the barn swallow. They nest under your eaves. Um, in uh, oftentimes, um, I'm sorry, the uh, the barn swallow and the common house martin that you saw earlier, they nest in the very same fashion. What uh, the Europeans do is they will put a board underneath these nests to kind of prevent the fouling from dropping onto the pavement or the or the decks below. Uh, barn swallows are incredible insectivores. That's one thing that you're going to find in the swallow family is they're all insectivores. And that means that they eat insects exclusively. They're not eating uh, anything like berries and they're not eating your vegetables and they're not eating your apples they're not eating your raspberries they're not eating any of that kind of stuff they're eating insects mostly flying insects now i'm i'm going to show you a picture of purple martins a little bit later and i say that they eat flying insects and then i'm going to show you a picture of purple martins on a feeding tray and uh, we'll talk about that a little bit later so uh, barn swallows <coughs> also nest in most of the united states and canada and they overwinter in South America, and they've got a. The, they're pretty populous in in this area, and they're doing quite well. This is the purple martin that we're going to be talking about. Uh, this is a female purple martin. Uh, this photo was captured uh, by Heidi Hughes. She works out at the uh, Agassiz Audubon Society, and she was out in Greenbush at their Elder uh, Elderbush Manor, and this female purple martin was nesting there. Purple martins nest east of, mostly east of the Rocky Mountains, and their <coughs> wintering grounds are in Brazil and in South America. Uh, purple martins, the unique thing about them is that they are, they are actually exclusive insectivores, and they eat only on the wing, wing which means that they are flying while they eat. Uh, they have... Uh, a very low tolerance for cold, so once temperatures uh, go below 50 degrees, they can't feed. And if it's uh, rainy or windy, they can't feed. So if if it's rainy and windy in the early spring for three or more days, quite often purple martins perish. So they are really susceptible to that early that early spring time, and because they are a, a, a subtropical bird.
Now, this is quite an unusual bird to see in a pr presentation about purple martins, but there is some uh, similar links about the hummingbird and the purple martin that I wanted to discuss. And this is a ruby-throated hummingbird, and if you notice, I picked a picture that she doesn't have, or he doesn't have a very ruby throat. You'll see that that throat is actually brown. We're going to talk about that a little bit later, about what those, why those feathers look ruby when you see them in the garden. Uh, so... Ruby-throated hummingbirds are very similar to the purple martins in that they are mostly east of the Rocky Mountains. The ranges are very, very similar. Um, I think it's mostly just coincidence, and but the, the hummingbirds don't quite go as far south. They are just in uh, the, the southern uh, tip of uh, Guatemala, Costa Rica, uh, the Yucatan Peninsula, and Mexico. And Purple martins, uh, iridescence versus pigment. There are many birds that have pigmented feathers, such as parrots, flamingos. Those feathers are pigmented based on uh, pigments in the cells themselves. Purple martins don't have pigmented feathers. Their feathers are actually black. So the color is black, and they look purple. The sheen is actually of what, what we would say is purple. Um, the the purple-black comes from what they call iridescence. Those are where the light is hitting the feather in a certain way and bending the light, similar to the way uh, a rainbow is it produces light. And that's what's causing that purple color to come through. <clears throat> Similar in the way of the hummingbird. The hummingbird's feathers were actually, the th their throat feathers are actually brown. Oops. Bumping the button. The throat feathers are actually brown, and their tail feathers, as you can see underneath here, and their back feathers are actually black. Um, but the sheen, when the light hits it just right, they sheen an emerald color or a red color. The very same way um, the purple martin's feathers, the iridescence of the purple martin feathers sheens purple. And the flashes of green and, and, and red are actually not coming from the feathers themselves, but rather from the way that the light is hitting the, the feathers and shining back to your eye. It's kind of like adding light to your garden and that, that it's it's really an interesting fact that I didn't didn't know about hummingbirds when I started this presentation. So of course the winner in this situation is the the iridescence because that's where all the color comes from and that's where all the the beauty comes. Uh, this is a photo of the same feather just flipped over, and as you can see on the top of this feather, uh, you got a little bit of a purple. Maybe it's kind of hard to see on the presentation, but the iridescence of that feather is purple. And as you can see, the, the base of that feather is, is mostly black. Uh, the, the vein in the, that feather is pigmented black. The facts, one of the facts about purple martins that's uh, often uh, overlooked is that they do not eat 2,000 mosquitoes a day. <laughs> purple martins um, forage high above the ground, anywhere between 150 feet and 500 feet. So that's very, very high in the sky. So if you put a football field on end, it would be, uh, what is that, 300 feet? So that's, that's the kind of range where a purple martin is, is foraging for food. So uh, any flying insects up there, uh, wasps, dragonflies, um, midges, mayflies, anything that's big and ugly flying around in your backyard and above is what purple martins are going to be eating mostly above the tree canopy. The fact about hummingbirds is, hummingbirds, you always think of them as being an insect, I'm sorry, a nectar drinker. And they have been doing some uh, research about hummingbirds, and they've found that they also eat insects as well. And this particular photo that I found um, was actually of a hum uh, Anna's hummingbird that had had grabbed um, a mosquito. So uh, for years we've thought about purple martins eating thousands of mosquitoes and mosquitoes mostly fly below the, 
tree canopy is where the warm-blooded um, uh, animals exist, and purple martins are above the tree canopy where not a lot of warm-blooded mammals exist. And the hummingbird is mostly below the tree canopy where all the flowers are and it will grab insects. Now I'm not saying that hummingbirds are huge mosquito eaters, but I thought it was kind of interesting how the, the two paths crossed with hummingbirds and purple martins because uh, I would have never thought of hummingbirds uh, picking out small, um, small insects. And, and they, but they do say with hummingbirds about 25% of their diet consists of insects. Uh, in addition, uh, and the remaining 75% uh, being nectar. I've got a little uh, patch of common milkweed in my garden, and in the middle of this slide, it's kind of hard to see, is a little uh, monarch uh, butterfly caterpillar. And I planted some milkweed a couple of years ago, and it's grown, and I've always been trying to attract butterflies. Well, you might wonder why would I try to attract butterflies if I've got purple martins? Because, you know, purple martins are just going to eat your butterflies. Well, do purple martins eat butterflies? Yes. But do butterflies mostly stay under the tree canopy? Yes. So with the exception of when they're migrating, and they migrate anywhere between 20,000 um, 20, feet and, and 41,000 feet. So way above where the purple martins are foraging. So <coughs> I wanted the butterflies because I love the butterflies, and they are, um, they are quite beautiful when you see them um, in the spring, just adding another layer, a dimension of color to your garden as well. I have a whole presentation on purple martin migration, and um, one of the amazing things about purple martins is that they nest here in the United States, but overwinter um, mostly in South America, oh, mostly in all of South, all of South America. And <clears throat> the purple martins are only here for about 100 days, and they are the remaining of that, the remainder of that time down in South America in their wintering grounds for about 200 days. So it's a very short season that purple martins are actually here. They arrive in mid to late April and they leave by mid to late August. Yeah, well. How long do they live? Uh, purple martins can live up to 13 years at the oldest martin. Their average life, life expectancy is right, right around three to five years. Uh, purple martins, they say half of the adults that, that fledged babies won't make it back to your colony, and half of the babies that fledged won't make it won't survive their first winter. Now, uh, populations in this area have been <coughs> in a decline um, since 1966, and if you do the, do the math, I mean, if only half of them are making it back, that's why their populations are in, in that decline. And, the, and of course, we've uh, basically destroyed all of their native ca uh, nesting cavities. Purple martins have a history of nesting in tree snags. That, this is before the early uh, Native Americans even got involved with purple martins. Uh, they nested in, in, in tree snags. The tree snag is, is just a, a, a old stand of trees where the trees have died and woodpeckers have made holes. And those woodpeck purple martins are a secondary cavity nester, which means that they use the cavity of somebody else's nest. They're not going to necessarily evict somebody who's using the nest, but they will, once they've left the nest, they will use that nest. Uh, they like to have uh, be in groups, uh, purple martins. The minimum size of a colony that I would even ever recommend starting with is six, and they they make nice uh, 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 gourd racks that I'll have some pictures of. Uh, that you can hang these these type of a uh, these type types of gourds on. Uh, what happened is. Native Americans had discovered that purple martins uh, didn't get along with crows, didn't get along with hawks. So they had <coughs> originally hung up gourds for their, for, their, for their drinking water and found that the purple martins were curious about these gourds. 
found that purple martins started nesting in these gourds, then found that they were uh, not real friendly with the hawks and the crows, which was a perfect marriage for them with their drying fields. So they would, their, the, the meat drying fields that would get ravished by crows and hawks, um, they would put up these purple martin houses in their gardens, and that would keep the crows and hawks away from their drying fields. So that's how, the, that's how the, the, the marriage between humans and purple martins became. Uh, European settlers came over to the United States, put the European spin on everything. Uh, they started putting up wooden boxes, uh, started to paint them white, and eventually uh, purple martins started to make a traditional shift from their native nesting cavities to a human supplied housing. As the Europeans settled the United States, they started um, clean uh, foresting, uh, cutting down the native tree snags, and within a couple thousand years, um, Purple Martins had made that traditional shift to be exclu exclusively uh, dependent on humans for their housing. So, yeah. Well, yeah, and that's, and that's why purple, purple martins um, don't like them, so they chase them away. Since purple martins are in a group, uh, and they, th they basically outnumber the hawks. So with, I've got a cooper's hawk that nests about two blocks away from my house, and when that cooper's hawk comes around my yard, I've got 30 to 100 purple martins chasing after that cooper's hawk. <laughs> that cooper's hawk is getting out of there. Yeah. So, so yeah. they even keep the grackles out of the yard? Um, you know, unfortunately, there's not much you can do about the grackles. <laughs> and, and I know, the grackles are the worst. I have a whole presentation on urban myths about purple martins. Mm -hmm. And I, I talked about the grackles because, <clears throat> you know, since I, uh, since I have martins in my yard, I get probably blamed for every bird dropping in the neighborhood. Yeah. Which, as we all know, if anybody has a a uh, bird bath out there, we all know that the uh, grackles are the worst. And and why they are is grackles uh, drop their um, their fecal sacs in bird baths uh, oh, okay. because what they traditionally did is they would drop their fecal sacs in lakes. So anybody who's got a blue house is really, really susceptible to <laughs> grackle <laughs> droppings, which is which is which oh. uh, which is a very very obvious thing um, in some neighborhoods. Well, yes. they put them in my garden pond. That's why. I yep. Yeah. But I get back at them. They they usually lose a few of the babies into the water. Uh, yeah. <laughs> Sometimes it's really windy. Yeah. No. They they, they want to go drink in there, and the babies are unsteady, and they end up. In oh. There. Okay. I need some piranha in there. <laughs> in our neighborhood, we are grapple free because the falcons from UND came and ate them all. Okay. You know, that is, that is um, um, one thing that I have noticed with the Cooper's Hawk. Um, I, I mean, I've got a Cooper's Hawk that's about, like I said, about a block away from my house. But I wouldn't, wouldn't say by near my yard is grackle free uh, because the grackles are, are very numerous in this area. It would be really nice if it was grackle free in my neighborhood as well. That was kind of funny, uh, my friend. Was just watching the grapple in the tree, and all of a sudden, here comes a falcon from behind. Yeah. And that was the end of that grapple. Yeah, that Cooper's hawk uh, came in and got one of the grackles too, and I mean, it just grabs it and goes. Yeah. Uh, well, anyway, one of the things about the migration of purple martins is that. Uh, when they make their migration down south, they kind of take their time. They can take about 40 days to get down all the way south to uh, Brazil, to their very southern point. But on the way back, purple martins make a beeline back to the United States. Now, it used to be thought that purple martins were scouting out. The very first arrivals, they thought, oh, they, we've got scouts. They're going to scout out and find out if the, the weather is all right and if there's insects. But uh, we, they're doing research with Purple Martins and they're putting on backpacks. And those backpacks are called geolocators. I've got a partner down in South Dakota who's, who co-founded the Purple Martin Association of 
Dakotas with me. And he um, is doing research with uh, York University. They put these little backpacks and they track, called geolocators, and they track the sunrise and the sunset. And from that information, they're able to point out on the map where those purple martins uh, rested for the night. So on April 23rd, I believe it is, or April 28th, they put the backpack on, and I'm sorry, by August 20th, they put the backpack on. August 23rd, they were down in Louisiana. And they're able to uh, track that they went across the Gulf of Mexico, uh, which is a non-stop 18 to 24 hour fight, flight, which can be anywhere between five to 600 miles, mm -hmm. which for a 55 gram bird, which with seven and a half inches long is just incredible. And uh, they make their migrations all the way down south to the southern part of Brazil, southern part of the Pantanal, and then they overwinter down in that area. Uh, one of the things that's uh, beautiful about this area is it's one of the largest wetlands in uh, the world. And they basically fatten up for the winter. That's really what they're down there for. They're not nesting. Um, they, they will go through their molt uh, over that, that time period. And of course, purple martins are like other birds that are aerial insectivores, they can't molt quite like a Canadian goose. Where a Canadian goose, when they molt, they lose all of their flight feathers and they can no longer get up into the air. Where a purple martin can't molt that way because it is an insectivore that has to catch uh, insects in the air. Their style of feeding is a hawker style, and I don't think I mentioned this quite yet, which means that they are flying when they are searching for their uh, insects. And uh, there's a different kinds of feeders, like uh, the, the kingbird, which is a salier type feeder, which they will be sit, sitting perched on a, a, a pole or a, a, a post or a windmill and waiting for insects to fly by and then they'll go diving after them, where purple martins are um, most, most of the time a hawker style feeding. Although they do say purple martins will be sometimes seen gleaning off of leaves, so if they're eating tent caterpillars, which are up in the canopy, they w they w they have seen them gleaning off of those those type uh, migration habitat. Uh, I have a for yep, you. go ahead. I couldn't see your chart on the previous uh, okay. slide, but how many days did it take for oh. it to get from? You said started about the twentieth of oh. August. How long did it take to get to the final point? It there? took 40 days to get to the final point. And then, you know, they, they made a couple of stops, you know, along the way. But it only took 20 days to get back. Mm -hmm. And they have tracked some purple martins that can make that trip in 13 days. They tracked one that had done uh, the trip from, from Brazil to Pennsylvania. And it had made a female that had made that trip in 13 days. She was return, returning to her the colony where she successfully fledged young the previous year. And that's one thing that's interesting about purple martins and hummingbirds. They return to the same place where they fledge or find food. Now, I say the same place, but it's not ag exactly the same place that they fledge. The martins that fledge from my nest will, will disperse slightly from my colony and find other colonies to keep from uh, crossbreeding with, um, with, their, with their parents or their siblings. So they will find a, uh, a nest site within about a 200 mile radius of, of my colony. So in at Turtle River, out at Agassiz Audubon, on the Greenway, I, I fully expect that those colonies are, gonna, are, are being populated by the fledglings from from my colony. I haven't had the privilege of being able to ban purple martins yet, uh, but hopefully within the year I'm going to have, um, I'm going to get uh, involved with a bander and hopefully we can ban and study exactly where my purple martins are fledging to. Where are the sites of the Greenwood? Um, at 13th Avenue in Belmont. Yeah. It, um, I, I 
I, I was very excited to get that right by the sledding hill. And it's a, it's a beautiful spot. It, it, um, I put the house up on Earth Day and I had three pair that fledged 12 young, which is exciting for, for a very first year. And it's, it's just, an, it's just going to keep growing from there. Uh, this particular uh, picture is of the Agassiz Audubon site. This house is the same house that I put up on the Greenway. Uh, we applied for a grant and we got it from the Purple Martin Conservation Association. Heidi Hughes from Agassiz Audubon Society took one house and I took the other. And um, the, the placement of this house, you will notice, is it's not near trees. Uh, so one of the important things about Purple Martins is that they don't like trees near their house. Now I said that they traditionally nested in tree snags. Well, that kind of contradicts what I just said. Okay, live trees. They don't like live trees near because they are aerial and they like their airspace. Where <clears throat> as le uh, live trees with, with, um, with leaves hide their predators such as Cooper's hawks and other types of hawks that um, uh, hawks and owls that can prey on purple martins. Uh, tree, squir tree squirrels, um, uh, gray squirrels, red squirrels, they also can sometimes cause trouble with uh, purple martin houses and raccoons as well. Uh, this, this particular photo, you can't really see the grass is so tall, but you can't really see that it has a predator guard on it. Uh, when selecting a site for a purple martin house, um, I use Google Earth. It's a great little tool. And this, um, this is the particular site of the AC Audubon um, site. It's right at this point. It's right on the, um, it's on the property for the Agassiz Valley Resource Management, Water Management Project. Say that 10 times. Uh, <laughs> and what's nice about this site is it's close to humans. Um, this, is, this is the residence of where uh, the park manager lives. And it's um, a wide open space, no trees, and near water. Now, a lot of people say, oh, well, I don't live near the river. I'm you know, on the west side of town. There isn't anywhere in Grand Forks that's um, too far from water uh, for Purple Martins because they have a five mile radius of where they feed. So <clears throat> it, it, if, you're, if you're anywhere in the, in the city limits of Grand Forks, that's a perfect place for Purple Martins because we've got the Coolies, we've got the Red River of the North, and there's, there's plenty of water sources for Purple Martins. You don't necessarily have to have a 20-foot uh, pond in your backyard to attract Purple Martins in. Although that is one really nice feature that would. <laughs> <laughs> uh, <clears throat> the habitat that Purple Martins um, like to nest in, um, this is, the, this is the, uh, the site that was out at uh, Turtle River State Park and I got involved with the park manager earlier this spring and he had said we've had these purple martin houses up for eight years we really haven't attracted purple martins we've had one or two pair every year can you come out and help us out and see if we can we can get these sites going so I came out there in the early spring and one of the things that I noticed is that they had a, an English house sparrow nest in uh, one of their purple martin houses English house sparrows were introduced into the United States in 1850 and 1875, respectively, um, by Shakespearean enthusiasts. They released 50 birds in Central Park, and in 50 years, they had populated up with the European starling at least to over 20 million birds uh, from coast to coast. Uh, the European starling and the English house sparrow are both non-native species to the United States. Neither one of those species are protected by the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service or the government in any way because they have decimated native, te uh, native nesting populations of eastern bluebirds, purple martins, tree swallows, and the like. So <clears throat> one of the things that we uh, as purple martin landlords have to do is um, take care of um, English house sparrows and the way I do that in Grand Forks is by the use of nest box traps 
and I have have this little nest box trap and I, what I usually do is I'll let the English house sparrow start to build the nest in um, in the nest box uh, possibly lay even a couple of eggs and set that trap inside of this nest box and wait for the female and the male to um, go into this little uh, trap and the trap door goes down and with that you can dispose of the uh, English house sparrow. Uh, it's, it's an unfortunate fact that um, that if you um, want purple martins you can have purple martins but you have to take care of the uh, English house sparrows. Uh, the way I take care of um, European starlings is by the use of what is called a McEwen crescent shaped entrance. Uh, that's this uh, half moon shaped entrance. It allows the purple martins to enter but it doesn't allow the European starlings to enter. The reason being is the purple martins have very long legs and they have a bit, very big belly and their legs are too long to allow them enter access to this, uh, access to this unit. Uh, the rules for one of these McEwen crescents is that the the bottom shape of the the moon here or moon shape or crescent shaped entrance should either be flush or no more than one fourth of an inch uh, below the the ridge. This this shape is actually uh, designed out of a three inch circle, and from top to bottom is one and three sixteenths of an inch. Yeah, yeah, I, made, I actually made this this nest box I made. It's made out of western red cedar, um, and it, it comes in, it comes with four sections like this that you bolt together. And I'll show you a picture of it a little bit later in the, in the presentation. Uh, the, when I started working with uh, the tree swallow, I mean, I'm sorry, the Turtle River State Park Manager, he had um, asked me if the location of that Purple Martin housing setup was a very good, and I don't know if any of you are familiar with Turtle River, uh, they got a chalet out there and that's where that Purple Martin house, housing systems are set up. And I said, the location couldn't be more perfect because it's open wide space, giving them lots of area to fly around. It's near the edge of trees and there's water nearby. And that that's, that's really what Purple Martins need for a really good location. Uh, this is a picture of my mom's backyard. She, you can see she's the gardener. Uh, and and this, is, this is that gourd rack that I keep on talking about. Um, these, are, <clears throat> these are PVC gourds and a lot of, a lot of them, uh, you, could, you can either purchase these or you can grow your own if you're, you know, you're, you're, in, you're into growing, growing gourds. I've never really um, gotten into growing gourds. It takes a lot of room, um, and they're they're a lot of work because you have to paint them. You have to keep them maintained. I'm a little uh, little less ambitious, and I use the the PVC type because you can uh, open them up, dump out the nesting material, stick this whole thing in a 10% bleach solution, wash it up, and it's ready for the next season. Uh, this is a How much do those cost? Um, these can run uh, about thirty dollars a piece. They're about thirty dollars a piece. So if you're getting six of them, it can you know can run you some some money. Yeah. They'll probably last. Oh yeah, they'll last. Yeah, they'll last definitely years and years and years. Right. Yep, if you take care of them. Yeah, my mom is actually giving her her, her uh, gourd rack system to a granddaughter of hers who's interested in purple martins. Uh, this this particular system holds 12 gourds. Uh, she moved over to the gourds that are more like this. Uh, these are owl gourds. They protect the purple martins from owls and hawks. Uh, the purple martins can fly in, uh, feed their babies, and actually I've, I've, I've seen most of them are flying in from the sides, uh, feed their babies, and fly out the other side. So uh, the reason why these uh, um, protect them is uh, if the owl comes along they can't reach they can't reach into that nest cavity to grab all those babies <coughs> uh, 
in here, uh, in this picture, it's really kind of hard to see. This one's really kind of too small, but you'll see that there's open spaces here. You know, my mom's kind of at the edge of town, um, but you don't really see any water in this picture, which, you know, except for this little mud puddle in the middle of a lake, but or in the middle of a field. But so there's a swimming pool right here, which sometimes Purple Martins will go down into a swimming pool, uh, grab a drink, because they drink as well as eat exclusively on the wing. And Purple Martins will sometimes be found uh, flying through a water sprinkler or uh, through just to grab a grab a drink to eat uh, a drink. Uh, they very rarely are found on bird baths, but two years ago, I had a female purple martin that had come down to my bird bath and grabbed a drink, drink as well. So the important thing is the location of the purple martin house. That's what's gonna. That's what's gonna attract them, and quite often with birds, um, you can attract them by putting out a feeder can't attract purple martins by putting out a feeder. The only way to attract purple martins to your yard is by putting up a nest box. Uh, a little a bit earlier, I said the minimum size nest box that I would ever recommend is six because they are colonial nesters, which means they like to be near other purple martins. Now, <clears throat> I had mentioned the tree swallow earlier, which is a solitary nest. Quite often what you'll, what you'll find is the tree swallows arrive a little bit earlier than the purple martins, and they will try to claim your purple martin house. That's when this little guy comes into play. You put a individual tree swallow box about 30 feet away from your purple martin setup. You close all of the purple martin uh, unit holes until you see purple martins, and the tree swallows will be um, will be more than likely relocated to their own nest box. Now, if you put it about 30 feet away, the reason is is because that's their, uh, their area of protection. They protect that area from any other birds entering into that area. And if <clears throat> another tree swallow comes along, tries to claim your purple martin house, this tree swallow won't allow it. So it's just a cooperative way of um, of uh, getting purple martins to, I'm sorry, tree swallows to help purple martins. And the purple martins and tree swallows, they are a cooper they're cooperative as, as well, just not in the same nest box. So if the purple martin comes along and wants to nest in that, that nest box, they have no problem with that because they're not competitors in that sense. Uh, tree swallows actually are aerial insectivores as well, but they do not, uh, they do forage a little bit lower than the purple martin, so they're not competing for the same food sources. Uh, this is the picture of uh, Grand Forks, and this is the exact location of where we have uh, the purple martins on the Greenway. It is just by the sledding hill, and it was um, <coughs> this was uh, this house was put up. Like I said, on Earth Day, um, May 6th, I think it was, is when I saw my first male purple martin there. And by the end of the season, I had three pair uh, that, that nested. Coincidentally, always, all three of them nested in the lowest unit, which is quite unusual because usually they nest on the highest unit. All three of them must nested on the lowest unit. And I had a, a second year male who built a nest in here but couldn't attract a female. So the males, um, both males and females uh, build the nest. Uh, the female, uh, if, if there is no female, the male will start building a nest when nest season begins. Um, mostly the female brings in sticks and the male is responsible for bringing in green leaves. And what they do is they line their nest with green leaves to raise the moisture content of the nest, keeping those eggs fresh. <coughs> now I had said earlier that a purple martins uh, eat exclusively on the wing. And then I show you a slide of purple martins sitting in a feeder tray. Well, <coughs> what I fill this feeder tray with is uh, eggshells, oyster shells, and sand. Purple martins need, 
need a supply of calcium and they need uh, a supply of uh, sharp gravelly type things to help digest. They use that in their, their crop to, to help digest the exoskeletons of the insects that they eat. One thing that's really interesting about uh, these particular purple martins is these are all males. And it's quite unusual to see that many males sitting on, on, the, on the feeder tray, but it was a really cold day. And I, I, wouldn't, I wouldn't be surprised, and they're all, it was a cold, windy day, and they were all facing the wind. So they were just kind of probably trying to uh, grab some of the, the, the heat that they were getting off of this feeder tray. Male purple martins will escort their females to the feeder tray to allow them to consume the eggshells. And once the, once the female is done, she flies off and the male will follow her. The reason why they do that is because the, the pair bond is so strong for that season that they are um, they're, they're co-oping and they don't want other males to uh, mate with their females. Now, females are kind of uh, promiscuous and that they will <laughs> that they will actually lead on a subadult male while she has mated with an adult male mm -hmm. and the reason why they do that is they want they want the genes of a male who has made the migration more than once and the subadult has a little bit more uh, more energy than the older males so she wants to make sure that if her older adult male dies, that she has the help to raise the young <laughs> instead of having to do that on her own. So she will lead on younger adult males, which is very interesting. I've seen that many times uh, through, through my experiences with Purple Martins. <laughs> This is what my backyard gets to sound like. Europeans put that White House spin on things. We've got a White House where our president lives. And Purple Martins have, uh, 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 Purple Martins have actually just, they've been attracted to white since then. When, once they made that traditional shift, they just became attracted to white because, simply just because of, of that white house that they put up originally. So that's, so if you've got a Purple Martin house that is painted red, more than likely, it's not going to get Purple Martins in it because it's not painted white. I mean, a lot of Purple Martin houses uh, out there, I do see that, you know, if they have green trim or they got a decorative uh, element to them, there's no problem with that, that part of it. Uh, but for the majority, if you're going to be more successful if you have a white house. Um, and, and it also reflects, uh, it reflects any heat. Uh, this is this is a picture of this this type of a house with these types of gourds un hung underneath it, and <clears throat> as you can see, it um, it's got it's got four of these units bolted together. So four of these units will make one level, and then you can stack additional levels on top. Uh, I have reduced the size of this uh, colony once I started. Uh, Purple Martin Associ Association of the Dakotas to try to get Purple Martins to uh, go into other nest sites. Uh, just because I just don't think it's uh, necessarily the best thing to have all of the Purple Martins in one area. want to dis disperse them into a community and instead of having just having them in my yard, we can have them in all sorts of yards. So uh, the size of this uh, colony has been reduced to I think I have 14 pair. I think that's what I had. I have 34, and now I have 14. So just reduced it to this size. One one of the one of the behaviors that purple martins have is that pair bond that I talked about earlier. If you see in the upper uh, right hand corner here, there is a female and a male that are flying together. Um, they're going to go out foraging. 
um, or their their nest building at this at this particular moment this female right here she was trying to get into the nest box with a big stick and I was I was standing on a ladder trying to take a picture of them so it was it was it was probably hilarious for my neighbors to watch me uh, <laughs> with these with these birds but um, very fascinating how the males and the females they will go out together they will nest build together and um, this year uh, on April 12th was when my first female arrived she arrived and she uh, went directly to this east two unit and she was the first one to lay the first one to fledge babies um, during the breeding season, they pair up, and I kind of talked about uh, the females are the ones with the the less or the least colorful of the, the pair, and the males are the most colorful. Um, and males are of all solid black with the iridescent purple sheen. Females are of a more brown color or a dingy gray on the bottom, and they're shoulders will ha have sometimes a little bit of iridescence. Uh, purple martins start breeding, um, start returning to um, North or this part of North Dakota, like I said earlier, late part of April. Uh, they don't start actually uh, building nests until about May 20th. So they're here for a whole month before they even start building their nests. So once they start building their nests, it usually takes about a week to 10 days and they'll start having eggs. Um, once they lay eggs, they will lay anywhere between three to eight eggs. It's very rare to have seven and eight eggs, but this year I had three nests that had eight, or, um, three nests that had seven eggs. Uh, most of the time it's usually five to six. They will raise those young. Uh, once they, they will sit on those eggs for about 15 days, they will hatch, they will take care of their young for 30 days. Once the babies leave the nest, they will sometimes come back for up to a week to 10 days, but that's all in the course of about 100 days before they leave, uh, leave the area. So it's just a very, very short window of time that they're even around. Uh, this is a picture of a purple martin nest, and I don't know if you can see this, but you can actually, the way this picture was taken, uh, the sun was shining in, and you can actually see the em embryo growing inside of that egg. It was quite a magnificent uh, thing to see uh, as those veins uh, spread out into those eggs. Uh, she laid one, two, three, four, five eggs, and you can see that the nest uh, is lined with green leaves. Uh, those were put in by the male. They usually put the fresh uh, green leaves in immediately before they lay eggs. So that's one of the ways you can tell when uh, purple martins are getting ready to lay eggs. Um, females usually use just regular sticks that they pick up off the ground. Uh, you can also use, uh, what I use is cedar dog bedding, stuff that you pick up at Walmart or wherever any pet supply store. Uh, you just put a handful of this inside the nest box. Uh, cedar dog bedding has a little bit of uh, insect insectivore property to it, so it kind of keeps the nest mites down, keeps the bird fleas down. Um, there's some things about purple martins that aren't always that pleasant. That's one of the things that you can do to help reduce that without using chemicals or pesticides. Yes? It sounds like <clears throat> you're taking pictures and looking in these nests several times, you know, uh, how do you do that? How do you get up there? Oh, you yeah. Um, the, the way this housing system is designed is that it's designed on a winch and a pulley system. So I can crank a, on a winch and it comes down on a cable mm -hmm. and it goes back up and a, a little bit later I'll, I'll show you how that house lowers down on the pole. I've got a picture. Uh, purple martin eggs are about 70, I mean, I'm sorry, about 17 millimeters um, 17 millimeters in size and so not very big uh, this is a fake so not that uh, went to Michael's and I found this and <laughs> <laughs> so this is not a purple martin egg um, so this is just um, ju just the size that they are um, when they hatch 
um, they usually hatch within three days of each other. So the very first one will hatch, and then all the, the, the little babies are usually all hatched within, within three days for sure. Sometimes they're a day or two apart, just depending on how, how they matured in the <coughs> egg. The population of purple martins has been in a decline in this area since 1966, according to the breeding bird survey. Uh, it, it's it's really unfortunate. I, I don't remember if um, I, I don't actually have a picture of a of of the map. Um, but in North Dakota, we very we don't really have very many purple martins in comparison to some of the southern states like Louisiana, and in northern Minnesota, uh, with the with the competition from sparrows and European starlings and um, possibly even pesticides and the populations have been really have been really struggling uh, and that's why um, you know I started this organization I think it's important to have these birds around um, there's uh, any number of um, resources out there to get information about purple martins and how to bring them to your backyard they do bring a life and a personality to your yard that no other bird does uh, simply because a lot of times when you have bird feeders you go outside the birds are gone with purple martins you can go outside you can be right underneath their uh, nest box and they will be feeding their babies and singing and moving around and there's there's just They've, they've developed this relationship with human beings that they found out that humans are taking care of us. And uh, the more that I'm near a human being, the less likely I am going to have uh, an attack from a predator such as a hawk or a raccoon or an owl. So they've, they've developed that way through that traditional shift when uh, Native Americans had started to first put up purple martins uh, back in the early 17th century. Is there a certain height that, that the pole for their houses has to be? Yeah, the purple martin houses should be at least 10 feet tall, but they can be up to 20 to 21 feet high. Um, I don't recommend anything higher than that because of the winds uh, that we have around here, and you, you just don't need, they just don't need to be. Uh, some people say, well, if you've got tall trees nearby, you can have your houses even higher. And yeah, that's tr that that's true. It's not really going to be too high for them. Uh, why don't you go into a, a little bit about the the male plumage? Because I've got a picture up here that it looks like a, one male and one female, but they are both actually males. Uh, purple martins don't get their full plumage until their second year, and th they call that after second year. And that's an adult male purple martin has the full purple bottom, full purple top. The second year male, which means a male that was just a young last year that went down to Brazil and came back, he will have a few purple feathers on his throat or his chest or his undertail. And Sometimes this, I mean, sometimes it's very difficult to even determine which is the, the adult male because they're not quite this purple under the, under the throat. Sometimes it's all white all the way, and they'll have just one purple feather on their chest. And I always think of this as a, as a teenage boy, just growing hair on his chest. <laughs> <laughs> the females also do not get their full um, plumage until their second year. Uh, a second year female will have these arrows that point to the bottom of her t to the bottom of her tail. So you see, you got one, two, three, four arrows, and the the second year female will have a nearly white undertail. So their plumage isn't really as as easy to tell. But from the previous slide, if I bring that one back up, you'll see that the adult male, or the second year male and the females are very, very similar. So sometimes it'll look like you've got two females going into the same compartment. And it will actually be um, either an adult female or a second year female, but a sub-adult uh, sub or second year male. 
and that's how you can tell from their plumage. Uh, one of the things that there's uh, an organization out of Erie, Pennsylvania, it's a national organization called Purple Martin uh, Conservation Association. They publish a quarterly magazine called the Purple Martin Update. It is filled with information about Purple Martins. Uh, the Purple Martin Association of the Dakotas is an affiliate of theirs, um, so we can we, sh we can share resources, we share stories, um, but we are an independent organization from there. Uh, nor North, we specialize in the areas of North and South Dakota, specializing in in problems that we face in North and South Dakota, whereas they're a national organization, um, um, more general, uh, very heavy on the research. I mentioned earlier that um, I've got a partner down in South Dakota that co-founded. He's very heavy on the research. He does the geolocator research. He banded 500 purple martins, uh, purple martins young, purple martin young this year, and they will. Um, try to study how they disperse and where they go. I have uh, contact uh, from a gentleman in Dickinson, North Dakota, who has Purple Martins, and that's the, the most southwest location that I know of Purple Martins in North Dakota. Anywhere southwest of Dickinson, um, it's kind of more of the Badlands area, doesn't really, isn't really populated real high with Purple Martins. Um, and Anywhere in South Dakota, east of the Missouri River, is where Purple Martins nest. Uh, there's also uh, publications out there uh, from the the Birds of North America has a has a, a sheet, and it it details a lot of the information about uh, the the information that you saw in this presentation today, uh, plus a whole lot more. Well, this is a this is a picture of the nest box as it has been lowered down to an area where I can actually see it. Uh, <clears throat> you can't really see the pulley. The pulley is on the other side. But this is what this nest box is, just wrapped around the pole. And you can open it up. You can, you can, check, you can check the eggs. You can count the babies. You can remove English house sparrows. Um, the reason why a Perk Martin Association of the Dakotas recommends that you check nest box at least weekly is because it allows you the opportunity to identify if there are problems with the nest box. Um, blowflies are one predator that they are one pest that they are having in Minnesota. I have been blessed that I haven't had blowflies. Uh, they lay eggs uh, in the nest material of the young and um, the, the maggots basically eat the babies. So what you want to do is, if you do get blowflies, is you just want to take that nest material out, just dump it into a trash bag, and put new, clean nest material in, put the babies back in, and they'll be fine. So it's a real cruel way to go is for them to be eaten by maggots. So that's why we, we recommend that you, you check that nest weekly. Make sure that there's nothing going on. Um, sometimes um, a purple martin will get killed by an English house sparrow, like one of the parents. And if that, you know, that bird is in there and it's passed away, you can just take that bird out, throw it away, and hopefully, you know, they don't have to live with that, that, um, that disgust in the nest. Yeah, go ahead. Do you have a picture of that fly? I don't have a picture of that fly. It, it actually looks just pretty much like a house fly. But it's a little, they're, they're also called buffalo gnats. Yeah. So they're just a just a little just a tiny little fly, yeah. And they 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 do bite quite a bit. Yeah. <clears throat> One of the joys about being a purple martin landlord is that you can actually be right there with them and see what's going on. This is a male that I had come back to my colony for three years in a row. He was very protective. He allowed me to check the nests but would stay in that nest the entire time while I did the nest check. So sometimes I'd have to pick them up, you know, move them over to the side a little bit to see if it, you know, the eggs had hatched and how many babies were there. Because I, I do keep very good record of um, 
how many babies are in each nest because later on in the season sometimes a baby will fall out of its nest it'll be trying to reach out the hole to grab an insect from its parents and it'll get a little too far out and it'll topple out onto the ground well since i keep these great records I know exactly which nest he came from, so if he survived the fall, I can put him, lower back the house, put him back into his nest box, and make sure that he survives uh, until fledging. Like I said, this male was very protective. He would sit on the eggs and then uh, the babies every time I would check it, and he was so protective that he would wait until the house was all the way raised up before he would leave and the female would have to come back before he would leave that nest box. <laughs> Male purple martins are not able to sit on eggs or babies. They do not develop a brood patch to warm the eggs, but they can protect the, the young and the eggs. Okay. Yep, go ahead. You said that that one came back three years in a row? Uh, yes. And so if you don't ban them, how do you know it's the same bird? I, well, you know, I don't technically know that he was the same bird, but you could just tell from his, I could tell from his personality. I mean, <laughs> he was the only one that would, he was the only one that would stay in the nest box, and he came back three years in a row. And after that, I've never had another bird that has done that. So it was a very unique experience. And... You can, you can actually, once, you, once you've been a Martin landlord for as long as I have, spent as many hours as you do with them, you kind of develop a, you can see what their relationship is like and how they interact with you. I have Purple Martins who, lo and behold, after the eggs have just hatched, I always get one or two birds, and I, I haven't really kept track too good of track of this in the last couple of years, but I have had one who comes down and swoops at me after he lays eggs. I mean, after he has babies. And I think it's the same bird, but I haven't, I, like I said, I haven't paid attention to this one. And, you know, he never touches me. He just swoops down and he makes a horrible noise. And I tell him to stifle himself and he eventually <laughs> flies away. But purple martins are just as scared as of you as you are of them. So I've never been touched by a purple martin. Uh, but you know, this particular bird does swoop at me when I go out there to do the nest check. But as soon as I get the house back up and I walk away, they're, they're fine. I, I do hear about people who let out their dog and their dog gets harassed or their cat gets harassed by purple martins. Um, I haven't had that experience, it's kind of rare um, what is more common is if you've got a barn swallow that we mentioned earlier, those are very aggressive and people scorn them because of their mess and because of their aggressive nature. Um, and unfortunately, uh, with barn swallows, <coughs> the real unfortunate fact about that is that they are so aggressive because people are getting less and less tolerant of them. I've come across many, many people who are saying, oh, barn swallows, I hate those. I use them as target practice. Mm -hmm. And I'm like, well, that would be an awful expensive uh, hunting expedition at a $14,000 <laughs> fine for killing migratory birds. So I, I, don't, I don't recommend that at all uh, because all of these birds are protected by the, uh, the U.S. government under the Migratory, uh, uh, mi mi migratory Treaty Act of 1814, with the exception of the European starling and the English house sparrow. Uh, this is a picture of my, uh, go ahead. Uh, two things. Um, when you picked up the bird to move him, did he peck at your hand or anything like nope, that? Nope, nope. He just, he was, ve they're very, um, they are very non-aggressive. I mean, he just, he just sat there. He just, he just yeah, didn't do anything. Is he overprotective? No, they're, he, he's over, he's, he, they're not overly protective. But, but you said that one male was. He, yeah, he was protecting his young. He was protect, but he didn't. But he, but he was not, yeah. I mean, they know that humans are there to help them. And I didn't do anything to him that would cause him to, to think that I was uh, going to cause him any harm. You know, the one thing about um, trapping and um, the the English house sparrow, is that sometimes you catch a purple martin. And that's what I love about these traps, because 
Um, well, in Grand Forks, at least, they've got laws that, you know, it's very, that you have, you check traps every 12 hours. I check my traps far more often than every 12 hours. So if a purple worm never gets caught in a trap like this, I just basically open it up and let it go. And he will usually come back to the same, the very same cavity after I've uh, got rid of the English house barrel that's been causing him trouble. Um, in these gourds as well, <coughs> I've got a picture, or I mean, not, not a picture, but I've got a trap in this particular board that does the same thing. So if a, a English house sparrow is giving me any trouble in a board, I basically just swap out that board for this board, and within a matter of a couple of hours, I can I can get that English house sparrow out of there. Go ahead. Yeah, the other thing I wanted to tell you about is we used to have this very intelligent cat that was an East tree, and we had her on her leash outside the back door, and the purple martins were dive bombing her. Oh. And so my husband looks towards the door and sees the cat up about this high and goes, okay, what's this? And he goes over, looks out, and here the cat has the purple martin underneath her front paws. And she's talking to him. And she's telling him to leave her alone. <laughs> and then she let the purple martin loose. And after that, the purple martins didn't dive bomb her anymore. Oh, wow. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you know, speaking of cats, I, 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 um, one fact about cats is that feral cats, and that's cats that are out in the, that are domesticated cats that are living out in the wild are one of the number one killers of wild birds. So if you have cats, yeah, it's great to keep them in the house or at least keep them away from your birds and bird feeders. Um, this is a picture that my wife took when my son and I were out at, um, at the at the circus in town it was a double rainbow and it doesn't show up in this picture but this is what my house looked like early this spring before i had decided to reduce the size and and get those uh purple martin houses out into public sites i had 34 units um doesn't really show up real well but i've got a little six gourd rack it's just six little it's six gourds like this it goes up up and down on a pulley system um it it works great if you want to use natural gourds or artificial gourds. Uh, that's just a preference of the landlord. Uh, purple martins sometimes, they say, are a little bit more attracted to the natural gourds because they're dark inside. Uh, I haven't had any trouble with uh, purple martins not being attracted to these. I recommend the McGowan crescents, which keep out the starlings. Um, down here in the little corner here, or in between these two houses, I've got this little perching tree. It looks like a TV antenna. All that that is is a place for the purple martins to sit, and they, they've got a place to rest. This little black box underneath there, that's a little bat house that I haven't attracted any bats to. Um, this, is the, this is the wooden house with the four boards underneath. They recommend hanging the four boards underneath as an additional method to attract purple martins because they are really attracted to the gourds because of their history with the Native Americans. Um, I guess the future of Purple Martins is hopefully going to be looking stronger as we get this organization going. I'm very proud to have been able to adopt the Turtle River site uh, that fledged 17 young this year. They had uh, four pair. Uh, put up the Greenway site, I mentioned earlier, had three pair, 12 young. Uh, this year I don't even know how many Martins I a nest are fledged at my own site, but uh, it's only going to have 14 pair going forward, and, and hopefully we're going to get more sites going uh, in the community. I've talked with um, I've talked with the Myra Museum, and hopefully we can get um, get a house set up there. Uh, it wasn't just not the right time this year because I was a little bit late getting a hold of them, and I had already made the arrangements with the Greenway, and two new houses in that little area would have been too much. So um, I think getting Purple Martins back into the community uh, is a real benefit because of what they can do uh, with the insect populations. Uh, one of the things that I've noticed over the last uh, 10 years that I've had Purple Martins in my yard is that two weeks after they leave, the insect population in my backyard skyrockets. And that's the, the moths and the big, ugly, fluttery things that are just annoying. Um, 
I don't have any trouble with the Purple Martins and my Monarch Butterflies, which I welcome every year, simply because my Martins are my Martins are feeding up high and my butterflies are feeding on my flowers. And uh, the one thing out at Turtle River, I, I, this is just a picture, I think I have 19 Purple Martins that were captured in this photo. Uh, this was just shortly after some of them had fledged, but I obviously had some visitors come. Uh, and. I feel that that's a success, is, is if we can get Purple Martins in public sites because our young people uh, really have a disconnect with nature. Mm -hmm. uh, my son is at home today. He normally comes with me at these presentations, but he's probably heard it all before, <laughs> so he probably doesn't need, the, he doesn't need to hear it anymore. But um, I, I get my son involved. I bring my son out there uh, every time that I go out. I encourage you to bring your children and your grandchildren. And the thing with Purple Martins is this is a wonderful opportunity to get your children involved because they can touch the eggs, they can touch the babies, they can see them. And Purple Martins don't care. They're not going to abandon their nest like some other birds do. Uh, that's pretty much all I have. The one thing I, I do want to mention is um, I've got a friend out at Agassiz Audubon. Uh, she published this book. I've got her business cards uh, up front there. Um, Agassiz Audubon um, Society is not very well known in the community, I don't think. Uh, I've, I got involved with Heidi because she asked me to do a presentation for her at the East Grand Forks Library. And Agassiz Audubon Society is a beautiful place uh, because it's just, it's really at the eve of something really great. Uh, there wasn't a lot of involvement with the community, but with Heidi as their new manager, um, uh, it is destined for a future of really great things. They are t uh, she had mentioned to me that she needs gardeners, and I said, I will mention you, uh, because they want to get, um, they want to get their grounds back into a, a really beautiful state. Uh, it's been really neglected over the years, not a lot of public involvement. So if, if you are interested in helping the Agassiz Audubon Society, I would uh, greatly appreciate that because of the relationship that I have with Heidi. She is just a wonderful person. Um, she published this book, uh, Expert's Guide to Backyard Bird Feeding. Um, mentioned something about Purple Martins, and of course there's nothing that you can feed Purple Martins except for eggshells and, uh, and a, few, uh, a, few, a few little bit of, of grit for their, for their digestion. Um, you can always get a hold of me. I've got a website. Um, like I said earlier, I'm from the Purple Martin Association of the Dakotas. I started this organization um, on a, I came up with the concept at 2 o'clock at night. <laughs> I, had, I had been laid up from a second ankle surgery in three months and I wound up having to take short term disability and it was not going to work for me to do nothing so I had to do something and I said to put all of my energy into creating this organization. We are a nonprofit organization registered in North Dakota. Uh, our region that we specialize is in North and South Dakota. I am just finishing up 100 hours worth of paperwork to get my 501c3 uh, status from the IRS. And that is, um, that is what I have about Purple Martins. If you have any questions, let me know. Where do you get your supplies? Um, your the supplies that I use, I get. I had gotten most of everything from the Purple Martin Conservation Association. They are out of Erie, Pennsylvania. They are the, the, the national organization that we're the affiliate of. And then this house is actually was actually built. I built and designed this house several years back after my brother built me a house. He he made mine out of plywood, and it just didn't last. It it warped and. Uh, I had that house up for about two or three years, and I built this one out of western red cedar. And, and what I really love about this house is I can take this completely apart. I can stick this unit into the bleach solution and clean it up. And 
it offers a lot of protection from the elements. I painted this house back in 2004, and I haven't had it painted since. And it's really easy to maintain and really easy to open up because it's just on an eye system, a hook and eye system. And the, the, the Purple Martin really loves it because it doesn't, um, it offers them protection from predators. I do have plans for this Purple Martin house. They're not, um, I had them professionally done, but I haven't uh, gotten everything finished. So if you're interested in uh, putting up a Purple Martin house, um, you can certainly contact me. I can I can actually send you these plans and you can build a house similar to this or you can purchase um, a gourd rack and, and gourds from Purple Martin Conservation Association. Um, I've got um, two hats left. So if anyone's interested in buying two hats, you can buy two hats. They're $20 a piece. That's it. Any questions? Thank you. Very interesting and well done. Uh, we, uh, uh, Terry Mann brought in some books and uh, did everybody get a chance to put their name in the jar of the book that they are interested in? 